Would you say then that the absence of love, when we separate ourselves from love, that this is the root cause for illness? Love is the great healer because love is the, the juice that is actually allowing us to create and become the human beings that we are. Dr. Gladys McGarry, you're a mother of six children and you are really, really successful in what you do and you are obviously super healthy and 103 years old, which is amazing. So at 93, I finally accepted the fact that my voice was my voice and it was to say what it needed to say. So I encourage us all to, to really pay attention to what it is that your inner voice is saying to you. And sometimes the best way to get that is with your dreams. We are so alike. <laughs> and it's so funny when I look at you, because whenever I doubt myself, I envision my future self. So my 90 year old Laura, <laughs> kind of. And she looks like 100% like you. I feel like I'm talking <laughs> to my own <laughs> 90 year old <laughs> self. Ich bin aus tiefstem Herzen so dankbar, dieses Interview mit Dr. Gladys noch führen zu dürfen, denn Dr. Gladys, diese wundervolle, inspirierende Frau, ist am 28. September 2024 von dieser Erde gegangen und ähm, wacht jetzt über uns alle wahrscheinlich als Engel und ähm, es war für mich so ein Privileg, mit ihr sprechen zu dürfen und ihren Spirit erleben zu dürfen und hoffe, dass du dieses Interview ganz tief in deinem Herzen für dich mitnehmen kannst und ganz viel daraus für dich mitnehmen kannst. Und ähm, wenn du möchtest, so gerne natürlich auch die Foundation von ihr unterstützen kannst. Den Link findest du unten in den Show Notes. Und das Mantra von Gladys war, be glad. Also sei fröhlich, sei fröhlich. Und das möchte ich dir gerne mitgeben heute aus dieser Folge, um sie auch zu ehren und ähm, nochmal ganz viel Dankbarkeit und Liebe zu ihr hochzuschicken. Be glad. Lasst uns das heute für uns mitnehmen und überall, wo wir hingehen, Freude reinbringen. Danke, dass es dich gibt. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. And where are you? I'm in Berlin. Oh, my mother's family are all from Germany. My oh, really? My mother's mother came over right after World War II. I've got a really funny story to tell that, that people like to hear. Yeah, okay. maybe we start with that right away if you want to. Yes, I would. So my grandmother came over just right after World War II. And, and uh, the family settled in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And so we came over from India. Uh, uh, and when I was two years old, because every six years, my parents had opportunity to come back and see their families and so on from India. So I'm two years old, and we're visiting my uh, grandmother's home in Cincinnati, and she decides to go down to the basement, and I decide to follow her. So we go down to the basement, and she's doing working at the washing machine, and all of a sudden, she I guess, I don't know, I was babbling in, in Hindustani or something. She's been talking in German, and so she turns it on and looks at me, and she said, do bubbles so feed. <laughs> and I looked up at her and I said, do bubble to feel yourself. And she got, laugh. she got to laughing so hard, she chased me up the stairs. And it's been a family story ever since. <laughs> <laughs> That is so sweet. That is so sweet. And right, right after that, then my cousin came in. She was at the university. And she was talking about what was going on at the university. 
And apparently I piped up and said, me not go to the university, me go to the university. <laughs> so so those, are, those are my German stories. <laughs> that is so, so sweet. Oh, my God. Thank you for sharing. That is so sweet. So sweet. And um, when, I, uh, when I was reading your book, we have a very, um, we have many things that, so your life had many parts that kind of remind me of my own life so oh, one okay. similarity we have is we both had dyslexia in school and um oh. so yeah. there was something i was really struggling with and i actually like you i only understood it when i was grown up that i had dyslexia i felt like oh. really stupid all my life until oh. i figured out that it, that i have dyslexia and um Maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, this. How how could you let go of this feeling of thinking that you are stupid because you were in a system where you got labeled stupid if you don't fit into what people would consider intelligent? Um, how did you find your belief in yourself and your own intelligence? And to pursue then your dream to become a doctor, where, was there a certain moment where it switched? Well, it, it, it was a growing, <clears throat> growing process. When we started the American Holistic Medical Association, one time there, there were 10 of us sitting around a table, doctors sitting around a table, and we looked at each other. We, we got to talking about our lives or something. And we realized that of the 10 of us, six of us were dyslexic. Hmm. And so we said, well, no wonder. I mean, we had to, since we had to find another way of learning to read and write and all of that, I don't know how I learned to read and write. I just learned. And so we decided that uh, we have to find a way of working with medicine so that people can understand it and live with it according to their own way. And we understood that that had to be from the physician within that patient, mm. just like within the, our own dyslexic world, we had to find our own way. And mm. so it was that that, that for, for, you know, pushed us on to working with the American Holistic Medical Association, but it took us two years to figure out how to spell it because mm -hmm. the word <laughs> that we were looking at for had to start with an H, health, healing, or holy, not just the, the WH, but with the H had to be the, the word that was the center of what it was that we were talking about. So when you talk about the physician within, how can someone discover or, well, I, I frame the question a bit differently. So most of us in the medical system we, we grow up in, we believe the doctor is going to come and to heal us. And we give a lot, I think, a lot of power away to the outside to give us the answer, the healing. And one of your approaches, as I understand, is that the healing happens within the patient. And, um, you know, yes, absolutely. Uh, excuse me, I, sh I shouldn't. No, no, go, go ahead. You are here to talk, not me. <laughs> no, I may not be able to read or write like other people, but I can talk, okay? So that's my when my oldest son um, came through Phoenix when he had graduated from his orthopedic surgery. And he came through Phoenix and he said, Mom, he was going down to Del Rio to start his practice there in Texas. And he said, Mom, I'm real scared. I'm going into the world. I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. I don't know if I can handle that. And I said to him, 
Carl, if you think that you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But if you can understand that your job is to do the orthopedic work that you've been taught to do, which is awesome. I mean, if I have something broken, I want a good orthopedic person to work with me who can help really do know what needs to be fixed. So you do your job as you, with love, connect with the physician within that patient who is your colleague. And that's the real person that does the real healing because he will take, because you're reaching to him with love, because it's love that is the real healer anyway. Mm -hmm. You're reaching to him with love. The love translates it into what that person's inner physician can do to work with the whole process and do the actual healing. Well, he understood that, and he is now a retired orthopedic surgeon up in North, in Washington, and he's got plants, and and he's had horses, and you know, I mean, he's led a good life afterwards, but his orthopedic life has been awesome. Mm, beautiful. <clears throat> when you say love is the true healer. Can you maybe go a little bit more into this concept? I would, I would love to. I have five L's that, that help to explain it to me. So the first two go together, and they are life and love. If, if life and love, they function together like a pregnancy, When you were pregnant, you and that baby were one unit the whole time you were pregnant. What he ate, you ate. What you ate, he ate. What you thought, he thought. You know, it, it was a, a one unit process. But it became, and he became his own entity when he um, took his first breath and manifested as a person. All the time that you were working together, you were femifesting him within his, your body. And that, that was a growing process of love and life working together. When, they, when, when he, he was ready to, to become the person that he needed to become, he was able to take his first breath and he become became and manifested himself but it was the love and life that, that allowed that to happen the mm -hmm. third l <clears throat> is laughter laughter without love is cruel it's it breaks up families it causes wars it's terrible but laughter with love is joy and happiness the fourth l is labor. Oh, I've got to go to work. It's too hard. Life's too hard. Too many diapers. Too much to do. You know, it's just, it's just too hard. But labor with love is bliss. It's why you doing what you're doing. It's why I'm doing. This makes our hearts sing, you know. But to be able to do what you and I are doing is awesome, you know. But that is because love activates that. Mm. And then the fifth one is listening. Listening without love is empty sound. It's a conging gang, a gang. Well, anyway, it's, it's, it's just empty sound. But listening with love is understanding. These five L's for me have been able to actually put some structure into the way I look at love of, uh, as the great healer. Mm. Would you say then that the absence of love, um, or that we, when we separate ourselves from love, would you say that this is the root cause for illness? 
Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. It's because love keeps us going. Love keeps us. You know, it's like when I was working with uh, having babies come into this world, I swear, when that baby took its first breath, I heard the angels sing. I mean, it was that kind of a, oh, oh yes, you know. It, 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 it's bringing this together. But, but really, I didn't understand my own voice or, or accept my own voice until I was 93. Wow. And then it was a dream that did it for me. I pay attention to my dreams. I have uh, most, well, yeah, my life. But this dream was, I woke up, it was, I, and I woke up and I knew it was a sunny morning, and I knew I was kind of in my mind, I was singing and laughing, and that woke me up. And so I looked at what I was, the dream was, because it was still going on. And I saw myself as nine-year-old Gladys in the jungles of North India, where we grew up. My parents were medical missionaries there. And in our family, we were not allowed to uh, sing anything except hymns or bhajans. And I was nine years old, and I thought that was stupid, and I didn't like it. <laughs> and so I, I, I wanted to sing what I wanted to sing. And, but I looked, or I, I see my, in the dream, I see myself pe peeking out of the tent flap and making sure my younger brother isn't there because if he's there, he's going to tattle on me. He's not there. So run, I run as fast as I can, and I climb that m mango tree clear up to the top, and I'm sitting up there, and I'm singing, oh, man. Am I singing? I'm singing at the top of my voice, and I'm having a great time. And all of a sudden, I think, what, what? You know, I look over my shoulder, and Jesus is up in the tree with me. And I look at Jesus, and I say, Jesus loves the little children, right? And he's, he's laughing, and he's laughing, and he says, yes. And so I go back to my singing. But then I got to thinking, did he really say yes? So I look back over my shoulder and I say to him, I'm a still a little children, right? And he says, yes. And then I really go back to singing. And I say to myself, if Jesus thinks it's okay, you better start thinking it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so from then on, I realized that all the years I had written, I had written my books, I'd written articles, I'd talked to people, I'd done uh, lectures and all of this, but always with doubt that was I doing the right thing? Was I saying the right thing? Was it, so I would, would have to have somebody sort of let me know it was okay. Bill, my husband at that time, was really good at that, and he would he would nod or say or say go ahead and but but other people i just looked to other people not to change what i had said but to validate what i had said so at 93 i finally accepted the fact that my voice was my voice and it was to say what it needed to say so i i I encourage us all to to really pay attention to what it is that your inner voice is saying to you. And sometimes the best way to get that is with your dreams. And it has been for me. So I really encourage that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um that resonates so deeply with me, so deeply, because so I, um, because I, it's so interesting. We are so alike, <laughs> and it's so funny when I look at you because I always have. So whenever I doubt myself, I envision my future self. So my 
90 year old Laura yeah. kind of and she looks like a hundred percent like you so when you came up I was like oh wow this is <laughs> this is kind of creepy <laughs> because I feel like I'm talking to my own 90 year old <laughs> self kind of I love it. I love it. and it's beautiful yeah. you're validating yourself yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's beautiful it's for my brain it's really strange like it's it's like well it's kind of usually it's just in my mind and now you sit in front of myself and you look like my own 90 year old so it's really like i <laughs> it feels strange but it feels beautiful and um so and it's also so interesting because we have we are so alike in 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 the experiences we make because for me as well i have this strong strong calling and this strong inner voice and i know for myself my truth i know it and at the same time, there is this human, uh -huh. Laura, being, and she is so afraid of this invalidation or of people, because I don't know, on the one side, and I am interested how you think about it, I think on the one side, our own truth, this is what our soul is here to talk about, is our biggest strength. And right. at the same time, it's our most vulnerable part i feel right. it's both so right. it's so interesting that you said that it you were 93 <laughs> you realized it um because i read your books i listen to your talks and i just for me you are one of the most amazing beings on this planning and i think how could she ever doubt herself <laughs> so <laughs> how how for everyone who is at this point where they feel they want to speak their truth and at the same t time it feels so vulnerable how how what is there to to help someone to to maybe realize a little bit earlier <laughs> than 93 <laughs> it's okay well, to your truth you know, pay attention to your dreams pay mm -hmm. attention to what your dream is what you are saying to yourself mm -hmm. create a visual image like I have a, a part of me that is called Dr. Gladys and the other part of me is Gladys. And every so often, Dr. Gladys shakes me up and says, Gladys, <laughs> you know, pay attention. Or, or, and I have to say, um, okay, all right. But it's, it's a way of identifying that inner voice so that we know when it speaks, you better pay attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Dr. Gladys talks, I shut up. Mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I listen, and, and she is able to really help me become <laughs> Gladys. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's that uh, time when we accept. Uh, it, it's like when. I went through the divorce and and I was totally broken and I was coming I, I you know we had done all of these amazing things we'd had this amazing life we had six amazing children life was so good and then he asks for a divorce I mean I I I could put, couldn't put my mind around it I couldn't accept it and I was leaving work to go back to my empty house the, the only thing there was my dog and i was broken i was mm. shattered i was devastated i was i was awful i was terrible i was saying horrible things i was screaming at the world i was using words that i i don't even know and just it was i was driving driving home down i-10 and I was just, it was awful until I finally pulled off to the side of the road and stopped my car because I realized I was dangerous out of the way I was driving. I pulled off to the side of the road. I got out of the car and I left the door open. And I looked in the car and I said, do I want to live the rest of my life like that? 
because it was ugly. It was terrible. It was awful. And all of a sudden, the voice came to me. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I, it was, it was just like, there was my, my name right in front of me to be glad. And so I said, oh, all right. <laughs> and I got back in the car and I drove home and I explained the whole process to my dog. And she was very understanding. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we finished that. And the next day, I went into uh, town to the license bureau. And I changed my license, my car license, to be glad. Because wow. the idea that every day I went out to the car, I saw that as a reminder. But not only that, but every day. And I drove was 60 years later on with that license plate on my every car behind me would see be glad. So not only was I doing it for myself, but I was reaching out to other people with a, with a message of be glad. And so it, it, it really allowed me to become the person who I had been reaching for. And so uh, a few months later, I was able to write my ex-husband a letter and say, thank you for giving me my freedom. Because prior to that, it, everything had been Bill and Gladys. I mean, when we were introduced, this is Bill and Gladys. When we were on a podium, it was Bill and Gladys. It was never Gladys first. Well, now, I had front, front billing, you know, so it was a, a matter of then accepting my freedom and being able to do what I needed to do. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, I welcome. can, I can relate to that very much as well. <laughs> um, well, a lot of people can, you know. Yeah, a lot of us yeah. have gone through this. Yes, yes. Thank you. Can I ask you a question about being a mother? And um, because you're a mother of six children, which is amazing. Um, and you are really, really successful in what you do. And you are obviously super healthy and 103 years old, which is amazing. <laughs> um, what would you give, what advice would you give a woman um, who is a mother as well, and who's also having big dreams and wants to fulfill her own calling. Because usually there's always this bad consciousness that you kind of feel like, ah, oh, I, I should be with my children, but I have this calling. And you, you never, it's very, very difficult to be both. How, how, how did you manage that? It is, because when I was with the patients, that, there was a part of me that saying, I wonder what the kids are doing. I wonder if they're okay. When I was with the patient, I was, you know, it was the, this tug of war all the time. And I know I, I understand that, but I lived through it. You mm -hmm. know, I, I accepted the fact that I had a double role. And, you know, think about it. Nurses have a double role. Uh, teachers have a double role. Women, women now who work in factories have a double role. I mean, we have, we have stepped up to the point where we know that we can handle both. But when, when I came home, I shared what I had done with the kids. We talked about it. I, so these kids, you know, now they, I have four physicians in the family and a retired Presbyterian minister. And when he was, <laughs> when John, this son of mine, um, was seven years old, he came in one day and he says, I wish Jesus was here. And I said, well, I do too. But uh, why you? He says, because I've got questions. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, 
try me. Maybe I could help you. He says, oh, you don't have the answers. And I said, well, just try me. So he says, okay, how can God be if he never got started? <laughs> and I said, well, maybe it's like a circle. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. He says, I knew you didn't have the answers. And so he goes running off perfectly happened. But here, you know, he's a, his soul was saying, calling to him, and he needed to have the, that answer. And then my next son um, came in when he was four, and he says, I know something, I know something, I know something. And I said, Bobby, what do you know? He says, if I make a friend, and he makes a friend, and he makes a friend, it's going to go all around the world and come back to me. Of course, he's a psychologist. You know, wow. I mean, it was that kind of affirming what they knew that was so vital to what they were going to do with their lives. And I so encourage mothers to pay attention to the little things that the little people say mm. it's it's just it's just really in fact i have a great grandson now ian and uh his grandmother uh told us a story about uh him the the day there were three of these little children five-year-olds standing around a, a dish and the dish this is their Sunday school class, uh, had some money in it that was going to go to a place someplace in the world where the, they want, needed to have a well, and they didn't have the money to do it. So these three little people were putting money in for the to send there. And when they'd put their money in, they were looking at it, the little girl and the group said, should we pray? And the little boy says, I don't know. And my little Ian, he says, of course we pray. He no, says, wow. God is all around us. Let us pray. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. So, you know, these little people that are coming up, they need to have, have their voices heard. Mm. And if we don't recognize that reach that they have, to us as their parents for validation, mm -hmm. then then that's uh, that's part that's our job. I you know it's part of our job. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Yes, it's very true. It's amazing that you can re remember all those things. Your brain oh. must be amazing. Like it's amazing. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> I, I talk. <laughs> uh, it's that's amazing. So in your book, um, in German, it's Was ein gutes Leben ausmacht, uh, life well lived. Um, so it it says um, that it's six secrets, six secrets um, to health and happiness. And when I was starting to read it, I was expecting a book on health, like a typical, you know, book. Um, on health and then I was so surprised because it's a very very for me deeply spiritual book I feel it's way more spiritual than ever health uh, book I ever read and um, it's so beautiful maybe you can talk a little bit about the connection between health and our spirituality and in which ways our spiritual our own spiritual connection can help us to stay healthy well uh, absolutely <laughs> because um i had written five other books and uh they all were written because they had to be written i mean they were medical books they talked well, the first one was about birthing and then You know, the second one's about the ch chakras within ourselves and mm -hmm. so on. So there, I had these five books, 
but I there was a part that, that was not there. It wasn't the very essence of what was what they the books were about. They had to be about the practice of medicine. And since they were, I had to talk. It's sort of like my, like my being able to talk about what it is that, that I'm doing, but not, you know, really give it the juice. But this book was because I needed to talk about why we were doing it, why the mm. physician within us was there, why it was important to have love the great healer, because that's what it is. And as soon as I began contemplating that and working with that, this book began to evolve. So it, it, it was something that I had to live through myself and understand so that I could begin to present it to others and they could take it and do it in their way, not my way, but in their way. So then it becomes th their process because, you know, people tell each other, oh, for pity's sakes, get over it. If you just say, get over it, you're sticking it in a drawer and shutting the door, and you're not going to do anything with it. But if you live through it, you it has a message for us. And that message is is what's there for us to understand and live. So it becomes a living process. Would you say that um, when you talk about the inner healer or the inner physician, would you say that um, if someone is experiencing an illness um, of any thought, mental or like physical, emotionally, um, can we directly talk to our inner healer? Can we have like a dialogue? Can can a person have a dialogue with their own inner healer? I think, uh, I think so. I do it. I mean, Dr. Gladys has to tell Gladys to shut up sometimes, mm. you know, and it's a... <clears throat> a process of really understanding that our mind can conjure up things and work things through and be part of. But we have, you know, with, with the five chakras, we also have the thyroid. And the thyroid is the center of the free will. Mm. And I have this, now this is just my thought. This is not a theology. It's not something to be preached or anything. But um, I think it's uh, kind of like, you know, it's just these thoughts. When God created the earth, it was perfect. Everything was exactly the way it was, should be. Everything was in place. Everything was working right. But then he created the human being. And he said to us as humans, now, I present the earth as, as a perfect set, what it is. And I now ask, I, I now turn this earth over to you because I want you the only beings on this earth who have free will and choice. I want you to, to have dominion mm. over the earth. And we thought he said dominance. Mm. So we took it and we said, oh boy, we've got, we can do anything we want to because we've got free will and choice. And here, dominion says you take care of the earth. And what I'm finding as people are reading the book and, and I'm talking to you and I'm talking to other pe people, we, we as now are beginning to re reach for our true humanity. 
That's what I'm hearing in people. It's like, this is true. I, I, I understand these words. And, and we're reaching for our true humanity and saying, how can we have dominion and not dominance? And, and to me, that's, that's a huge revelation. It's beautiful. Would you say that there was what what I the, the thought once I had that the world, so Pachamama, the, the earth, is the direct reflection of humans in the sense of that all the illness we have as humans is directly uh, reflected on the health of the earth as like all the wounds the earth has the soil the water uh, the poisoning everything i mean it's the same we have within ourselves so would you say that the more the humans heal earth will heal as well oh let me tell you a story i i tell stories you know i absolutely i agree with you we have a had a friend who was a family friend. He ate dinner with us a lot of times and so on. And then he, he began to diminish and moved into dementia. And he didn't, didn't understand him. So we put him in a lovely home and it was they were taking care of him and all of that. So one day I went over to visit him and I took a little plant in a little, a little pot and a little green plant, and I took it over to him. And I said, James, here's your here's a plant for you. And it's uh it wants you to love it, but if you're gonna love it, you have to. And I it was he just looking all around. I I'm just talking to a empty space, you know, but I said, but you have to give it water and you have to, and I talked that, that way. And, I had no idea what he was taking in or what he wasn't. And so I left it with him. And I came back a week later, and he met me at the door. And he says, magic, magic. And I just jumped back and I said, what? He says, look, and he, box. And he goes over to the air conditioning box. And he says to me, push button, everything cool. Oh. Plant loves cool. He says, push button, everything hot. Plant doesn't like hot. And I thought, wow, here we are with this co contact of a living process that was going on between a living plant and a man who was in dementia that was healing and it was love the love the fact that the that the human who couldn't understand anything could understand the love that the plant felt I mean, to me, I was so touched and still am about the reality of how we connect with the living process of everything around us. The plants, the dogs, the, uh, you know, the coyotes or whatever. And, and it's, it's part of, of the amazing, uh, system that we have within us and the will is the thyroid and the thyroid is where we make our choices and we chose choose what we want to choose uh and and uh, either something that is creative and uh helps grow things or in the lower chakra you know it's the whole system of our, the way we as human beings are put together 
so that we can do the dominion that we are offered to do. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. So I have one last question. Um, this is a question I ask all of my podcast guests, and I'm so <laughs> excited to hear your answer. So imagine you keep on living a really beautiful, long life, many, many, many more years. But one day, there will be the last day of your life. And how life wants it that day, I would be there. <laughs> and I would say, Gladys, here is a white sheet of paper and a pen. And if nothing else you ever said or wrote, published, would still exist. So everything is deleted, your books, head talks, nothing exists anymore. There's only one sheet of paper and a pen. And you could write down three thoughts or sentences or wisdoms you would like the humans that come after you to remember. What would you write down? Love is the great healer. Mm. That would, that would be the message, because love is the, the juice that is actually allowing us to create and become the human beings that we are. Without that love essence, like within the um, pregnancy, When, when we loved that baby and fed the baby, that love, that, that's the thing that uh, not only connected us, but made the baby's life real. If we didn't love that baby and actually allow the life to go on, it wouldn't go on. But we loved it, and we love it, and we work with it. And it, it, it's a process of life. And love have to work together. They absolutely have to work together. And if they don't, it falls apart. One last question about that. Because I feel so many people being so disconnected from love. They are so afraid of opening their hearts, of loving themselves, of loving other people, of loving life again because they are afraid they were hurt, how can we return to love? First of all, you have to start thinking about it and, be, and not being afraid of it. Think about the joy that it brings. Stop thinking about the uh, um, fear that, you, that has been built into the word love. I mean, And we, uh, we think of it as sexuality or whatever, and we, hit, we have desecrated the word. If we can get, get our, not if, as we get ourselves back to what the word really means and begin to look for that light that allows us to understand what it means, then we're not afraid of it. But if we're, if we're, so um, um, afraid that love will hurt, then we stay away from it. But if we can begin to reach back to it and reach back to love as uh, our mother's arms or, or whatever we want to do and begin to feel that love that's there, but feel it within ourselves so that it's nothing else. Nobody else is telling us what to do. See, if people ask me, what secrets do I have? I only have the secrets that I have, and I can share those with you. But you have to either take them and look for them and work with them or, or not. And that's your choice. I mean, it's just pure choice. And if you choose it, you'll find how it works for you. 
So um, it's it the fear is is really what uh, will stop love. Mm. It, it, in in the chakra system, the adrenals are what carry the fear. It's the fire uh, center, and the uh, the one that we're talking about is it, it also is the love center. So the two of them work together at the level of the adrenals, and there's where the choice comes in, and and you choose. I mean, it's it's. Uh, when you begin to study these things, it gets so exciting. <laughs> True. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Dr. Gladys, um, I am so grateful that you spend your time with me and everyone listening. It's such an honor, such a pleasure, such a gift. I'm I'm so fulfilled by by the time um we had together thank you so much for the work you did for all of us especially for us women um thank and you for writing those book thank you for being just so amazing and for yeah really shaping the entire medical world into a more healthy and holistic Yes. Um, space so thank you for your commitment and i'm so glad that with 93 you woke up and you knew that your voice is here to be heard <laughs> so thank you jesus <laughs> thank you nice? so much <laughs> yeah well thank you for being one of my friends now thank you thank you so much <laughs>